Welcome to Like Maria and the first in our series of mini lectures on John Keats's Hyperion. Today we're going to talk about Hyperion, the epic and its contexts. So what we're going to find out is how do you solve a problem like Hyperion? The first thing to know about this poem is that it's not finished, so it's usually referred to as being a fragment. It comprises book one, book two and book three, and book three finishes at line 135. The genre of this poem is that it is an epic poem, and I'm just going to run through a couple of things um, about the epic genre. Um, as a starting point. So an epic poem is big. It is grand in its subject, its scope and its style. And by that I mean that it deals with big issues, important things to do with society, the world and the people that live in it and usually big moments in history. The second thing to note about a narrative um, that comes in the form of an epic is that it is long. Um, and you can look back and cross-reference to Homer's um, Odyssey and Milton's Paradise Lost as a little bit of extra context for this, and you will then really discover what a long epic um, is about. Epics deal with subjects um, very much beyond this world, things to do with mythology, um, or often religious themes, and they generally focus on a particular hero. Um, now here we have an eponymous hero, um, Hyperion, um, yet because the poem is not finished, we can't really see um, where Keats was going with this. Another key thing to note about epics is that the characters often have a voice, um, and it is um, quite usual to have a debate about what the next steps are. The poetry for an English epic um, has um, its roots in classical poetry and therefore has some um, quite distinctive um, elements to it. Um, the first thing we might note is that Keats uses, just as Milton did, lines of unrhymed iambic pentameter um, and these we know as blank verse. Um, so there is an underlying meter that is feels very comfortable um, for us to speak. He also uses particular epithets to describe characters um, and these are little um, flags that wave up um, when a character comes onto the scene and are usually something to do with their description. Here we have grey-haired Saturn and blazing Hyperion um, and this helps with the contrast between the two of these. There is also, and um, Keats noted this himself, and it was one of the things that he was troubled with within his writing sometimes, there are also very many examples of inverted syntax. And this is where the words are flipped round in their order in the poem. So, for example, Keats uses the phrase forward he stooped instead of he stooped forward. Or another example would be of influence benign, of influence benign on planets pale. And this is rather than of benign influence on pale planets. So he plays around and mixes up words um, for poetic effect. Another aspect of the poetry um, is that it's very rich in its imagery um, and similes are often built up and extended um, and allusions are often um, developed and um, by allusions I mean things that reach outside um, the poem. So a very rich web of complex images, similes, metaphor and illusions is characteristic of this type of poetry. There are also specific um, lists of things that apply to um, epic poetry. And these I've just put here are appealing to a muse. 
so um, within the poem, Keats asks his muse to transfer from focusing on the Titans to move over to focusing on Apollo, for example. Lists are also um, used in um, epic poetry um, and allusions I've already mentioned. OK, now to look at context. I'm first going to look at the immediate context surrounding Keats. He wrote this poem in 1818 to 1819, and this was a period of stress and change in his life. His brother Tom, who he nursed through his last illness, dies late in 1818. So this is a difficult time in Keats's life. Difficult also because his poem Endymion was not well received by critics. And Keats really took this to heart and went into a kind of depression about this poem. The last thing to note about Keats's immediate context is he was always very keen to become one of the greats. We know that he carried a portrait of Shakespeare around um, with him when he travelled. He looked up to Shakespeare. Milton was another um, literary character um, that figured um, highly um, in, in Keats's estimation. And it was Milton's epic, um, the, the status that Milton got from having written an epic that Keats um, aspired to. There are also some historical contexts that we should consider, and I will just point you in the direction of these briefly. So firstly, we have the French Revolution in the late 18th century, where one regime, an old fashioned regime of kingship, was replaced by a new regime of Republicans who wanted liberty, who wanted um, a uh, what was called fraternity, more um, friendship between people and a kind of brotherhood. They also wanted um, equality and they wanted a new way of ruling the country. So this, as we can see, has many parallels with the shift from the old Titans to the new Olympians um, in Keats's poem. However, we should note um, that the French Revolution had come about violently. Um, obviously, the Olympians and the Titans were fighting, but in Keats's poem, there is a gentleness and a beauty um, to the transformation of Apollo. And indeed, um, the um, shift to the new order and its beauty and its gentleness is supported by Oceanus and Clymene in their speeches. So whereas there is violence um, with the war amongst the Titans and the Olympians, um, we are also moving to a kind of more beautiful um, transition and embracing of the power of beauty versus violence. Talking about violence, we should also note that the beginning of the 19th century was a very problematic one um, for the British government. Um, there were um, people who were clamouring to have the vote and um, making their um, presence felt in the forms of, gen um, of demonstrations. Um, and there was a very violent um, put down of these demonstrations. These were generally peaceful demonstrations, particularly in the Peterloo Massacre in 1819. The government um, came out with guns blazing and um, killed protesters. And it was a very bloody, violent um, reaction. Um, so much like um, Enceladus in Hyperion in the poem wants to have. He wants to put down um, these jumped up new um, Olympians. Um, so my point here is that the French Revolution and incidents like this Peterloo massacre are very much in the minds of people and Keats when he is writing. Another key context for this poem would be Romanticism, um, which is a new kind of art, a new kind of poetry, fired by the imagination um, and spurred on by experiences in the world that are beautiful. Um, a real focus then with Romanticism 
on the importance of beauty. You should look up and research a little bit about these three romantic poets, Blake, Wordsworth and Coleridge, who are very much um, the start of the British um, romantic movement in poetry. But it is also a notable piece of context that um, the young poets who follow them are Keats, Byron and Shelley. They are called the second wave of romantic poets. And it would be fair to say that there is a little bit of a friction between these new guys and the older, more conservative poets. Um, this clearly could be related to the um, Titans um, being um, ousted in their role as um, monarchs by the younger, um, more beautiful Olympians. The last context I'm going to talk to you about today is other epics. Um, I've already mentioned Paradise Lost and the Odyssey a little. Um, I'm going to focus on Paradise Lost today um, and just make a couple of points about Paradise Lost and how we might use it um, relating to Hyperion. So Paradise Lost, written by John Milton, several hundred years before Keats. Um, at the start of this poem, we see um, Satan defeated. And I think it is no co coincidence that um, Keats starts his poem with Saturn defeated. Um, and they are both in very bad places. They are both downcast. The description of where Satan is in hell is very similar to the description of where Saturn is um, in the shaded veil, deep down, not being able to move without his kingdom. The second clear link to Paradise Lost, I would suggest, is that in book two of Paradise Lost and in book two of Hyperion, um, we get the people involved in planning for the next stage are given a voice and there is debate. Um, so the characters are dramatised through their individual voices and um, in Hyperion it is the Titans offering their different opinions on how to progress. In Paradise Lost it is the Devils. Um, lastly, um, I think that the themes of these two poems have much in common in that they are looking at a shift in power. In Paradise Lost, a shift in power from God to Satan and also a new knowledge that Adam and Eve take. In Hyperion, we have a shift in power from the old to the new. And we also have this experience of finding new knowledge. In Apollo's case, he suggests that um, knowledge enormous makes a god of me. So today I hope we've covered some of the um, themes and some of the background so that you have managed to solve a problem like Hyperion. <laughs>